she saw him leave that morning, but he didn't come back that afternoon. He didn't show up that night. Nobody heard from him. The teen's body was found in a rolled up gym mat in a high school in 2013. His death ruled accidental. Say my name and remember what you've done. Your hurricane has blackened out the sun. You can't continue to kill unarmed black people and get away with it. But if Kendrick did die of an accident, how, with all that distrust, how could you even ever show that? But then on the flip side, is they didn't treat it like it, it could have been a homicide. Lowndes County Sheriff Ashley Polk announced officials were reopening the investigation. Only angle is to find justice for my son. You can just tell death had come through our family and it just settled. Did, did had there ever been an incident where Kendrick had not come home one night before and not told anyone where he was? I, I don't recall mm -hmm. an incident ever because he always stayed in touch with his mama. Yeah. That was a must. If they couldn't stay in touch with their mama, they couldn't go. If they couldn't stay in touch with their daddy, they couldn't go. I thought it was really interesting talking to Lydia, who is KJ's aunt. She was kind of telling the story about the night that KJ didn't come home. And I think it's kind of crazy because I can't imagine as a parent your child not coming home one night. <clears throat> so I don't, I don't ever recall a night that he, could, he didn't, you know, prior to him going missing. I've never recalled a night or a time that he didn't call or didn't show up. It was just this incident where he didn't call, didn't show up, and didn't come back. Yeah, I feel like that would be traumatic for a parent not to know for an entire night where your child Up was. all day, all night, and then get off work, go to the school that you sent your child to, only to find out that's where your child's final place was. That's where he took his last breath. And a lot of, a lot of, a lot of times I sit and think, and I'm, I'm just like, I wonder what he was thinking in that moment, that all this was going on. What happened? What happened? What was going through his mind? Did he, did he call out for his mama? Did he call out for his daddy, you know? What was going through his mind? Oh, that's a tough place to go. I, I just... I, don't, I, I, I wouldn't wish this on nobody. Never wish this on nobody. But some days I think, why had it happened to my family? Why had it happened to my sister? I was thinking, well, maybe, you know, he was hanging out with Solomon. I mean, maybe he did call and Jackie didn't get the message or whatnot. Maybe he was hanging out with his friends or out to his friend's house or whatever, and Jackie just didn't get the message. Never thought that he would be found dead. Did, do you know, did any students ever come forward saying when the last time they saw him was? Because no one saw him at that basketball game that night, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Did anyone ever say when it was the last time or people just kind of went off what the cameras were showing? They had some kids give statements and things like that. I don't know what, what's, who gave statements or what the statements were, but um, a few of them I heard that they did see Kendrick before he went in the gym. Okay. But then no one really confirmed that he was out there after ever or saw him after. No. It's like after he ran across that gym floor, that was it. Yeah. On that camera that you, after he ran across the gym, that was the last time they, he ran across the gym and they were wheeling him out on a stretcher. Hello, is Theotis there? This is he. Oh, hi Theotis. My name is Ash. I am actually doing a documentary series on the Kendrick Johnson investigation. And your name had come up in regards to one of the EMS responders who came the day that Kendrick was found dead. That was a while ago. Oh, yes, <laughs> I know. Well, obviously the case was reopened. We decided to do this before it got reopened. They officially reopened it. I saw it on Facebook, but I didn't know if it was official. 
Because school tends to post some false stuff a lot of times. So that's what our whole show does is dig through myths about cases and other things. We're kind of wanting to go back and kind of take a look at all the information that had come out about the case. We kind of dispel myths. We talk to people who are actually there, investigators, EMS, people who are on the scene to kind of help clear up that little piece of it is what we try to do is talk to you about exactly what you experienced and what your thoughts were on that experience. And so your name had come up. So we were wondering if you were interested in hearing more about what we're doing and possibly doing an interview or what your thoughts were. Yeah, I'm in Austin. Yeah? Man, y'all traveled a long way. Yes, well, we think it's an important case. Don't. Sure enough. Are you still doing EMS work? Uh, yeah, I work for EMS now. I don't oh. work in the fire department anymore. Oh, nice. Yeah, we I don't live in Austin anymore. Oh, okay. Well, we do. We travel all over to do interviews, so it's not that. Where, where are you now, if you don't mind saying? I live in the, I live in the Atlanta area. Well, thanks for sitting down with us. Anytime. That was short notice, too. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty short. I think the gods must have wanted us to sit down because I just happened to be off and normally I'm working. So it worked out perfectly. Were you raised in Valdosta? No, I'm originally from South Florida, Pompano Beach, Florida. And did you move specifically to Valdosta to do firefighter work? Yeah. And what was your experience of the community there? Yeah, Valdosta's community. I mean, they love the fire department down there. Everywhere we go somewhere, kids always hide. The, the people in the public, everyone's always so receiving of the fire department. I mean, you can have a structure fire and people bring food. The whole community loves the fire department down there. You're like, well, superheroes in a truck. Everybody loves the fire department. Right. <laughs> yeah, you guys never get a bad rap. Nope. How long have you been an EMT? This November will be my 12th year. So was it just always something you'd wanted to do, or why did you go into that field? Being a firefighter seemed pretty cool when you were a kid. You're like, man. He gonna be in the truck, flashing lights. It's an honorable job. Why not? And now here I am, 12 years later. Did you ever have any thoughts? Cause I don't. I'm from New Jersey, so we don't have as many like Confederate flags, or we don't. As far as I know, I don't think there are any Confederate memorials. Does that the African American population there? Does that ever bug people, or is it kind of like it's sure been there it so was long? different for me? Cause I'm from South Florida, and in South Florida. You come at real different, diverse cultures down there. It's a, I mean, Haitians, Jamaicans, Cubans, Puerto Ricans, it's so diverse. Yeah. And everybody loves everybody. So I came to us, Valdosta, is seeing, I saw Confederate flags flying. I was like, this is weird. I've never seen this before. I'm like, this is what's normal around here. And it's so, and people just, they've got them on their trucks, in their yards, and it's just everywhere. It seemed like it was the norm. Being an African American male, does that ever make you nervous, or you're just kind of like, uh, it's just. I think in, initially you get uncomfortable, but then after a while you just get. So I guess this is what it is. Okay. Even though it shouldn't be the norm, but that's pretty much what it is, just because of what that flag represents. No, Lowndes High School now. There's a dead, dead body out here. Okay, where at, sir? Lowndes High School in the old gym. The day you guys got the call about Kendrick, do you remember how the call came in, or how did how do you guys work calls like that? Well, at that department, when a call comes in as someone in cardiac arrest, it's a cold blue. So a call come in as a cold blue, you're like, okay, then they give the location there, but the jaw kind of dropped because you knew the address was for the high school. So you're like, dang, I hope it's not a kid. And then, of course, you know everybody's nervous. You try because I was a, I was driving that day. Okay. And you drive over there because we were pretty close because our station is maybe less than a mile down the road. So we get there, everybody hop out, everybody get the bags and go in. And since I'm the driver, I position the truck, so I move the truck out of the way to make sure the ambulance has good access to them, so I'm not blocking their way. So we get I get inside and everybody's kind of just sitting there. And I'm like, dang, why is nobody working them? And then when you walk over, you can see that he was obviously deceased. There's nothing no one no one can do. And do you remember when you saw him, was he still in the mat or on the mat, or had they moved him? He was that still point? in the mat. The mat was laying down when I got in there. Okay. The mat was laying down. You can see uh, from the bottom part, you can see his feet. And then you saw his shoes scattered, and then you saw him, his face looked like he was kind of beat up or something like that. In your history of being an EMT, had you seen a positional asphyxia death before or a beating before? I wasn't even familiar with the term. After I heard it, I had to look it up and I was like, okay. But just using context clues and trying to see what the words mean, you can try to figure out what it was. Right. But I had no history of knowing what it was, so I try to, try to look up history and see other people that possibly died from similar events, and it's not really a lot of history on it.
we've tried and it's it's first of all it's hard to find people we we have isolated a few so we hope to talk to those medical examiners who worked on those just to see if the results are the same or if it's more indicative of a beating though what you're remembering is he did seem to be bruised or discolored along his face there was swelling in his face that you remember yeah, he was obviously discolored okay i mean yeah had you seen people who have been killed from a beating before? I, I can't say I've seen anyone that's been killed, but I've seen someone that took significant facial trauma from fights and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And did those seem, from your limited knowledge, indicative of what might have happened to him? Well, with all the swelling and stuff, it seemed, to me it seemed like maybe like he was in a fight and got some blunt force trauma or something like that. Okay. Just from me, just being a around fights and stuff it just seems obvious right it, it didn't seem like positional asphyxia or whatever they called it did you have a gut reaction because you know initially it just came out as cold blue you seen him he was like okay well that doesn't look normal a kid rolled up in the mat initially you think well maybe maybe he got in a fight or something someone beat him up and they because you know it's high school he could have got bullied or anything they could he could have got beat up they could left him in the mat he could accidentally died but I never thought that he just accidentally fell in there and just, oh, he suffocated. So that didn't ring true nah, to you? No, no, it, it just seems odd. Like he's a fully functioning 17 year old. It's not like a toddler that accidentally fell in, got stuck, couldn't get out. Like he's a, a big kid. I would think he had enough sense to not fall in and get stuck in that manner. And after all these years, has that thought ever been shaken? Have you ever been like, oh, maybe it was an accident? Or you? I never bought. I never bought that at all. I don't think anyone bought that. I mean, it just didn't make sense. They said like his shoulders were significantly wider than the diameter of the rolled up mat. So how can you fall in there if your shoulders are wider than the hole that you're gonna fall in? I mean, I'm not an expert, but it just didn't make sense. Yeah, yeah, just kind of seeing it, it just didn't, that yeah, it didn't exactly. ring, uh, ring truth to you, basically. I didn't buy it, no one bought that. Like, come on, really? Mm -hmm. That's the best y'all can come up with? It just doesn't make any sense. I mean, just looking at his body, it's like an accident, really? Like all the swelling and stuff, all the deformities to his face? It just didn't make sense. Not to me, it didn't. I mean, we've seen some of the pictures, but when you were on the scene that day, you felt that there was discoloration and swelling yeah, going on? Definitely. And was it mostly through his face or was it other parts of him also? Well, you, you can't really see because most from about here down was still inside the uh, mat. When he got there, it was kind of like, from what I remember, his arm was kind of like this. Okay. He was just kind of stuck in that position. Yeah, it sounded like when they had tipped it, he had slid out further. So maybe that's the point you came in at. Did you know at that point, had they unrolled the mat at all? Or do you believe that that was the, from when they laid the mat down, it, it was still in that same position? I can't really recall, okay. but just, just trying to put everything together, it seems like he was in there and someone maybe tried to pull him out or something. To me, just trying to picture it, if you say he fell in, I would figure like all this would still be inside the mat if you suffocate. There's no way for me to suffocate if I'm not, in, if my airway and stuff isn't inside the mat. Right, that's a solid point. <laughs> Do you think that someone falling into that mat and having that, like we were trying to think, first of all, how quickly would you die? And then we were thinking, well, maybe if it was an accident, the oxygen at the bottom was limited. I mean, it seemed like it had have, it have to be pretty tightly sealed. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, of course, you can be in that position and you can panic, which further uses the oxygen and reserves that you have in your body. So it's several different factors, but just saying that he fell in that just, it didn't make sense. Just want to break into the episode really quick and remind everybody to subscribe. If you do choose to subscribe, you want to do that on the website ashes to ash tv.com a-s-h-e-s t-o a-s-h tv.com all the money just goes back into us doing these episodes and creating this content so that we can find answers in these cases if you do subscribe you get discounts on merchandise you get to see episodes early you get to see commercial free content you get to see uncut and behind the scenes footage and then you also get invited to our private facebook subscriber group and what's cool about that is you get a little more attention from the team and you can ask questions and we do q and a's on there so if you can subscribe please do the show is obviously always free because that's how we get in tips and solve these cases. Thanks for watching. Back to the episode. After you guys saw Kendrick that day, did I'm assuming you were with other EMTs in your vehicle or mm -hmm. did you guys talk about what you had thought? Me and my partner, uh, James, we talked about it because him and I are really close. 
and it just didn't add up not to us. We was like, man, that don't make no sense. It didn't even seem right. But it, it we could talk more after the, the information came about how he supposedly died. That's when he really talked about it. And what did you what did you guys talk about at that point? We pretty much tried try to see how they can justify that he fell in their head first. Just trying to wrap your head around it like everyone else, just saying that it absolutely makes no sense. It doesn't seem possible. And do you remember about how long you were on the scene for that day? Mm -hmm. We didn't stay long because we were the fire department. We were, we were one of the first units on there because we were so close. We got in there. Normally, if something, if since he was obviously dead, of course, it's a crime scene, so they didn't want us messing up any possible evidence. So once he's viewed as dead, they try to get us out of there so we don't mess anything up. Okay, that makes sense. So you were kind of were in and out. And did you ever have any actual contact with the body or you just kind of saw it visually? No, nah, I didn't. Yeah. I mean, it was obvious. It was, it was no point in touching them or trying to disturb any evidence. In your impression from the times you've been out on these, did you think it was being treated like a typical crime scene? There, I mean, initially it, it seemed like they were. Okay. It seemed like they were taking all the proper precautions to preserve all the evidence that they had. And did you see anybody wearing like booties on the scene or is that not something that even normally happens? I think that probably happens a little later in the call, I'm guessing, because when EMS initially gets there, we're trying to preserve life. So we don't have booties. We're just going in and we're just trying to do what we can to help someone. Yeah, absolutely right. Hell, because you might still be able to save them. That should be the priority. Mm -hmm. Johnson County Sheriff has reopened the investigation into the death of Kendrick Johnson. So what was your reaction when the case was reopened? Did that make you hopeful or are you skeptical about the it being? I think it's more skeptical just because of the history of how they handled it last time. People are like, um, they just opened it just to try to please some people. It ain't going to mean nothing. They're not going to really do anything any different. That's just how it is now, what it seems like. Did you ever get the impression being in Valdosta or even your day at the scene that things might not have been being taken as seriously because he was African-American or that didn't really dawn on you? Of course people think that. I would think so. Yeah. I think it would have got a different reaction than if, if it was a little Caucasian girl. Like, it would have had a, a way bigger response. I mean, I don't think no one would go for that. Absolutely. I've been calling all dogs, but since it was just a little African-American kid from the hood, he's more expendable. No one cares. That's what it seems like, and that's what the actions have shown. That's kind of like why most people don't have no faith in in the police department, in their, in their whatever they're doing, or lack thereof, I would say. Well, yeah, and I think when you even a brief look back into history, I can see why the distrust would be so very strong. Or even hell, recent things like Michael Brown and some of the other ones, I feel like, are mm -hmm. jarring. It happens so often you can't even recall all the names. Do you think if it had been an accident, do you think that that would even be impossible to get? Because that's what we've discussed a lot, is if it was an accident, I don't even know if anyone would be able to believe it from some of the stuff that's happened. Do you think that people would ever be able to accept it? Nah, they were like, ain't no way. A kid of his size. Like, if it was like a smaller kid, you are like, oh, maybe it's possible. Mm -hmm. Because he don't know no better, but he was a 17-year-old kid. Right, yeah, a five or six-year-old you could see making that yeah. error, but not a 17-year-old kid. They wouldn't let Jackie identify um, his body. They wouldn't let her identify him. They tried to use a shoe to have Kenyatta to identify him. So we did a press conference. We did a press conference. And we were down, it was on a Saturday, and of course, you know, the courthouse wasn't open. And um, they still never let nobody identify his body. But eventually, like right before the funeral, they went, not right before the funeral, a couple of days before the funeral, they let Mike go in and identify his body. The way he described it was that Kendrick looked like they had sped up the decomposition process. Really? Whoa, that's weird. The room that he was in, it wasn't, it wasn't preserving his body. It was hot in the room. So somebody's trying to hide something. When we heard from him, I knew they're trying to cover something at this point. They're trying to cover something. What does it feel like to be part of something where it's authority figures and you're not trusting what they're saying? What does that feel like? Because how do you even battle that? I feel like I'd be I, so overwhelmed. It, it, it's with me. I know this is what I know for myself. I know all cops, all police officers and all law enforcement aren't bad people. 
But I know we you got some corrupt ones. Absolutely. Yeah, I do know that. Mm -hmm. In this case, it was a corrupt thing because y'all trying to cover for somebody's son. So now the whole all y'all are taking hits. Yeah. And I believe that Sheriff Prime was covering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I believe that. Okay, so there's another article that was released the other day that the confession tape was actually a hoax. I think one of the things most interesting in the news is there's been this rumor of a tape that has out. Kendrick Johnson's family say they recently obtained a recording of someone who may be confessing to killing him. They turned over the 25 second recording to the sheriff earlier this week. Now quote, they're gonna catch me anyways. I should have never done this. I was young and stupid. Kendrick didn't deserve this, man. A couple of seconds go by, and he ends with a very tearful, they're going to catch me anyways. Somebody contacted the family and said they had a taped confession. Um, we're actually working that case. It's still active. I told Ms. Johnson and um, Marcus Coleman, who's a friend of theirs, and we met with them, and they, they gave us a tape. And I told them, I said, you know, do not get your hopes up because there are cruel people out there, and of course they paid for this tape. So it, it could very well be a hoax. We, we're getting very close on doing something on that. We've got a couple more things that we need to tie some ends loose, and we'll, we'll have a statement on that shortly. And that, that's a cruel thing to do to a mother, to come up and say, well, you, you, we got this confession, we got this and that and the other. But, there are cruel people out there now. I mean, it runs scams every day and doesn't bother them one bit. Wow, I think that's crazy because, I mean, we, we had suspected that and we're nervous about that. I mean, obviously we were hopeful, I think like probably a lot of people, but the second I heard that they had to pay for it, not that the Johnsons did anything wrong paying for it because I can understand that desire to try to find the truth. But when they did say that, it did make me very concerned that someone was doing this for financial gain and not for actually quality reasons. Terrible. All right, well, I'm going to read you the article. Okay. The Lowndes County Sheriff's Office says the audio tape that was claimed to contain a confession in the death case of Kendrick Johnson is fake. The family believe they found a potential confession in March when they were contacted by someone claiming to have a recorded audio version of a person confessing. Johnson's family paid $1,000 for the recording, which they handed over to the Lowndes County Sheriff's Department to authenticate. Ashley Polk said the perpetrator claimed to be a second cousin of the boy who confessed and told Johnson's family he was at a birthday party with family members, and one of the boys admitted to have played a part in Johnson's death. The person who made the tape contacted Johnson's mother. Polk said once they were shown a picture of the person who created the audio recording, they knew exactly who it was and knowing the family in question, and said there's no second cousin that they are aware of. We identified him within 15 minutes because we have dealt with him before, said Polk. Lowndes County Sheriff department isn't releasing the perpetrator's identity while they talk to the victims. He's currently only facing misdemeanor charges. Wow, that's so upsetting. I mean, I feel like the family's gone through so much and now I feel like it's this case, whole case has been riddled with stuff like this. And it's almost like you can't believe anything you're seeing on this case. It's very hard. So one thing I think it's crazy when you hear Lydia talk about is how long Jackie, who's KJ's mom, kind of sat on the corner and fought to try to figure out what happened to her son. How long would you say after Kendrick passing away was Jackie still standing out there? My sister stayed out there. If I could remember, the last time Jackie being out there was back in 2018. Oh my. From 2013 to wow. 2018. Mm -hmm. Was that hard to watch her kind of keep fighting that that way? It really was because it was just like, at, at one point I even got discouraged. I don't know how she felt behind closed doors because my sister is a very, very private person when it come down to her emotions. She's a strong person in front of us, but very private. When she had, If she has to break down, we will never know it. We will never know it. And she didn't give up. She just... She needed this time to herself. She didn't give up. Because it, it, it would be days where she'll be on the corner, and then she'll leave for a couple of days because she got to go do interviews or she got to go across. You know, she was doing a lot of supporting other families. Yeah. That's pretty much why she came out the corner because everything had got so outrageous out here. 
when she would come off that corner and they thought she was gone, she'll pop right back up. Oh, y'all thought I was gone? I'm back. Surprise. <laughs> My sister would sit on that corner sometimes from sun up to sundown. I remember one day, it was 5 o'clock. It was from, she was down there from 9 to 5. That was her job. And it was scorching hot one day, real hot. She had on a yellow shirt and red shorts. I'll never forget that. Kendrick shirt. She always had a Kendrick shirt on, so she had the yellow Kendrick shirt on with some red shorts. And we kept telling Jackie, Jackie, you need to come home. You need to go home. You need to get out of this heat. Get out of this heat. Jackie sat there. She said, I'm going to sit down here until it's time for me to get off. I was like, okay, but it's hot. We can tell you ain't feeling good. And, and she was a diabetic at the time. Tell she wasn't feeling good, but she sat down there in that heat with, with, with those Kendrick signs, each corner. And some days she sat down there by herself. I ain't gonna lie, some days I just, my heart couldn't take it. Yeah. My heart just couldn't take seeing my sister have to do this. And I didn't leave her hanging. Some of us didn't leave her hanging. It just broke my heart to see. And yes, she did that many days by herself and sometimes, and, and with her mama. Her mama came down there every day too. But if her mama couldn't come, she was dying on that corner. She never missed it. But if she missed it, she always showed right back up. Yeah. Fighting. It was just heartbreaking to see. And then people passing by downtown, passing by, back and forth, speeding and running their engines, uh, get a job and all kind of, you know, cuss words and nigga this and, you know what I'm saying, all kind of stuff. Like, is this necessary? This is a baby we fighting for. What is y'all problem? when they first said it was an accident and closed the case. Do you remember what your reaction was to that? Ain't no way in hell. Say my name And remember what you've done Your hurricane Has blackened out the sun Play your game In a tangled web you spun and your rain While water fills my lungs I can feel the air I still bleed and break Though my heart is made of stone I shiver and shake Every no mistake Cause I'm standing on my own Maybe you could be my 